Good evening. Uh, for those who are watching at home, I'll introduce myself. I'm not sure everybody would know me. Um, I'm Bruce McCormack. Uh, for the last 31 years, it has been my privilege to be a professor of historical and systematic theology here at Princeton Theological Seminary. They say that uh, just before you die, and the minute you die, your life passes before your eyes. And I'm looking around this crowd and thinking, my life is passing before my eyes. I hope it's not a portent. But I'm grateful for the presence of all of you here today, and uh, I hope you have a great conference. My task tonight is to introduce the, uh, the next person who will speak to you, who is, in fact, going to succeed me as director of the Center for uh, Bard Studies here in Princeton, Dr. Caitlin Dugan. And uh, Dr. Dugan finished her dissertation uh, last summer. That's very appropriate. Applause. She finished it last summer um, at the University of Aberdeen with Phil Ziegler, who is present here. Wave your hand, Phil. <laughs> um, and she um, is now fully a doctor and uh, is well prepared, has been running this place for years, as everybody knows, and now is extremely well prepared to do so, to continue to do so, and to lead us into the next 25 years of this instant, this center's existence. So, Caitlin. Oh, Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to the 2022 BART conference. Um, if you should need anything throughout the conference, you can come and find me or one of the uh, graduate students who works here, Nicola, Chelsea, or Yannan. Um, Yannan is the tech person for the conference, so if there are uh, parts that you would, like to attend, you would like to attend online and you have trouble with that, you can talk to him. Um, so I have the lovely task of talking to you about fundraising for the BART Center. Um, as you know, we've been um, creating new programs here uh, since 2015, and we've been expanding. Um, we opened our doors 25 years ago um, in September, and there are so many things that I would like to do for the next 25 years, but that takes support and uh, more funding than we have now. So I created this brochure, which you should have received in your conference packet. Um, that will tell you what our current programs are. 
We have four uh, core programs and there are new things that I would like to do, which are in the center here. And then you can see on the right hand side what um, what your support will mean um, in terms of um, helping grad students, pastors, scholars um, attend one of the programs that we have here. Um, and then you will also see the save the date for the conference next June. So I hope you all come back. Um, and I worked for the last couple months to create a video for the BART Center. I really wanted folks to know um, what we do here, the programs that we have, and the history of the BART Center. Um, I am the only staff person, but there are so many people that came prior to me um, and started it. Um, and there's just a, such a rich history that I feel like most people don't know. So I hope you enjoy this video that I uh, created with uh, Ryan Hum. He's incredibly talented and um, I'm super proud of the last 25 years and I hope you will join me in helping us go for the next 25 years. So uh, if Yana wants to start the video, we'll play that. Awesome. Thanks. It has the this incredible understanding of the freedom of God. And so there's this kind of open-handedness that Bart has towards the task of theology and how dependent that task is on the Spirit of God. And I think because of the way that he understands theology as a kind of open-handed thing, it has the potential to have an endless constructive conversation. I see my work here at the BART Center as carrying on some of the best theological insights that BART had so that um, people can potentially use those for their own context, for their own struggles, for their own questions today. And so I think in the best moments that the BART Center has, it is not about BART. It's about something beyond BART and witnessing to what God has done for the world in Christ. Da passieren immer wieder die Irrtümer. Wenn die Menschen nur meinen, ha, jetzt habe ich's. Und da wird es wohl für uns dabei bleiben müssen, bei aller Offenheit für die Welt dorthin zu blicken, wo Gott unzweideutig für sich selber gesprochen hat. In Jesus Christus. My name is Dieter Zellweger. You see me standing in front of the house of Karl Barth. I often was here to visit my grandfather. And afterwards, we opened a good cooperation between the archives in this house and the Center for Barth Studies. And I am the president of the Karl Barth Center for Reformed Theology which we founded here in Basel, Bart's hometown, in the year 2015. As the representative of the younger sister of the Princeton Center for Bart Studies, I would like to bring our best wishes and greetings to the center on its 25th anniversary. I would like to begin by congratulating the Center for Bart Studies at Princeton Theological Seminary for its 25 years in existence. And uh, I must say I have had the good fortune and the honor of being associated with the center for about two decades and I've seen it grow. Bart personally has inspired me a lot. I preach regularly every Sunday now and it's hard for me to imagine doing it with the same passion if I never learned the theology of Karl Barth. The gifts that the Bart Center has given to my research and teaching and writing and ministry have been many. Reading Bart closely and faithfully, but also critically, forged a kind of intellectual community of friendship that I still look back on 
as a model for what theological community can be. Hey, I'm John Hardy. I'm thrilled to give a brief word for the Bart Center at Princeton. It was, it was a very influential place for me when I was doing my PhD on Bart's reading of the book of Job. Now I have a few friends, some students, who have a message for you. We support Bart Center at Princeton! In 2018, I had the privilege to attend the Bart Pastors Conference. Um, and what a wonderful experience it was. So thankful for the Bart Center and really excited for all the wonderful work uh, that can and will still be done. I deeply appreciate the BART Center because it is a resource for scholars around the globe and also adheres to BART's own understanding that theology needs to be within and in service to the church. For me, the BART Center is actually this. It's a center. It brings together and connects scholars, students, pastors, lay people, not only from the United States, but as you can see, from all over the world. I believe that Bart's theology is an important resource for the global church in the 21st century. With its firm roots in the scriptures and their center in Jesus Christ, with its reformed commitments and ecumenical breadth, and with its call to prophetic witness in changing and unstable times. As an Australian working in the field of Bart studies down here in Australia, it can be a lonely endeavor. And so I can honestly say that the Center for Bart Studies at Princeton has kept me going, has kept me energized and enthused. I think this is the kind of thing that the Bart Center does so well, bringing together emerging and established scholars to discuss a wide range of themes that deal with the intersections of faith in the world. Karl Bart was part of such conversations a century ago. They are no less important today. When we began the center, our goals were extremely modest. The uh, pitch that was made to us by the Karl Barth Society of North America was simply that they were looking for an institution who would house their minutes. That was all they were asking for, somebody to uh, keep their records for them. That all changed when uh, Steve Krakow became the uh, librarian here at Princeton Seminary. Steve had a huge vision. Scholarship can be a really solitary enterprise, and I find that great ideas come out through great conversations that require meaningful relationships. And the Center for BART Studies has done an incredible job of creating a space and a context for those relationships to exist and to occur in a regular way. BART Center has been really important for me, especially in terms of the connections it's helped me to make. So I think especially of the Graduate Student Colloquium, um, and the same is true of the annual conference. Yeah, really privileged to get to encounter some really senior scholars in my field, to get to know them as people, to see them doing really interesting, exciting, sometimes more experimental work. And it's pushed me to do more interesting things and be more interesting in my own work. If one thinks that the way Bart reads scripture and engages the theological tradition while reading the newspaper on the one hand, so to speak, is fruitful and helpful for the church today, then we need to invest in the Center for BART Studies. It really enables people to access a level of collegiality and collaboration that would be out of reach if, if there wasn't funding available. It's a really meaningful gift to give to people at the early stage of their academic or ministry careers. Doctrine. Augustine said is manna from heaven. It is what you need to know in order to live Christianly. To give money to the BART Center is to give money to the church, to ensure that the churches are well fed theologically. And what Karl Barth gives us is doctrinal theology at its highest possible level of achievement.
A very warm welcome also from me to this conference. Uh, supremely warm welcome to those scholars who are joining us from around the world online. It's very good to have you with us. But I have to confess, after three years of being away from conferences, it's even better to be with people in person once again. So particularly warm welcome and thank you to those of you who are here in Princeton to join us. It's been my privilege to have been involved in some small way in the organization of this conference. Although I confess that to be called a co-chair suggests some equal sharing of labor behind the organization of this conference, which is not quite the case. It's been my privilege to work with Kate as she has borne the huge burden that comes with organizing an event such as this. This evening, we open our conference with a paper from Professor Catherine Sonderegger. Professor Sonderegger is the William Mead Chair of Systematic Theology at Virginia Theological Seminary, having previously taught for many years at Middlebury College. She is a priest in the Episcopal Church in the Diocese of Virginia and completed her early scholarly work on Karl Barth with particular reference to his doctrines of Israel, his teaching on the Jews and Judaism. Since then, she's engaged extensively with the work of Karl Barth and indeed the reformed tradition beyond him. And in recent seasons has devoted her attention to constructive theology. There will be few of us either here or online who are unaware of the recent volumes published in her systematic theology. Her first volume on the doctrine of God and her second volume on the Trinity, processions and persons. And we eagerly anticipate the third volume on the missions of the Trinity, Christology and pneumatology. There are few scholars of Karl Barth or of reformed theology at large who've engaged with the material with the same combination of rigor and insight and grace as Professor Sonderegger has. And I'm truly delighted that you will be opening our conference this evening with a paper entitled Karl Barth and Reformed Theology. Thank you. I echo uh, Paul's words about how delightful it is to be here in person, to see so many of you I have known over the years at BART conferences and at other places of study and worship, and to meet new friends, new scholars in this field. Thank you, Paul, for such a gracious and warm welcome. I am honored to be here and honored to speak tonight. Was Karl Barth a reformed theologian? This is an odd question to ask, I know, and not just because I speak at a conference dedicated to Barth and the reformed tradition. It is odd because in one sense, it is hard to imagine anyone more reformed than was Barth. He emerged out of a distinguished line of reformed pastors and teachers on both sides of his family. He entered his theological studies as a reformed candidate. And unlike so many of us in the West today, he never made pilgrimage through several denominations or churches. Not for Bart, the trajectory from vague or anomalous spirituality to a distinctive Christian identity, as we find, say, in Evelyn Underhill, or in a different idiom, C.S. Lewis. Nor did he seem to hover between allegiances, now drawn to Rome, 
now to Geneva or Wittenberg, or to points further east, as did Avery, later Cardinal Dulles, or the young Thomas Merton, or in more agonized keys to Edith Stein, or Simon Weil, or Ludwig Wittgenstein. Bart began, remained, and never repented of his sturdy, reformed identity. His whole life long, Bart represented and belonged to resolutely the reformed and Calvinist traditions in his teaching posts, in his public presentation of the faith, in his churchmanship, and in his ecumenical engagement. He never wavered, and he never moved. In this sense, Bart resembles more closely his 17th century older divines, or 19th century pillars such as Hodge or Bathing, or even his United Church forebearer Schleiermacher, than he did the magisterial reformers, for whom a conversion, a turning of the bridle, constituted the entry into Protestant confession. We might add here too, a reformed element unmistakable from the church dogmatics. Bart dedicated much of his historical commentary and analysis to reformed dogmaticians. Calvin certainly, but also Ursinus and Beza and Zwingli, to Polanus and Cosius and Volibius, to reformed exegetes in the modern style, to the reformed modernists, Schleiermacher and Hermann, and to the reformed confessions and catechisms of which the Heidelberg Catechism held pride of place. Our conference this week unfolds the lifelong encounter Bard had with these major reform teachers. His dogmatic work is unrecognizable without this legacy. And yet, and yet Bard is not a reformed theologian in the expected fashion. Perhaps with an intellect as restless, as capacious and omnivorous as was Bart's, nothing ordinary could be expected here. Yet I would not want to assign Bart's idiosyncratic reformed identity to simple biography or mentality. Bart was strikingly and studiously reserved, almost reticent about his reformed credentials. He was a sturdy reformed theologian, yes, but I would say too a reluctant partisan. Bart was never a Calvinist in the way some theologians are Thomas or Lutherans. He did not begin a theological discussion with the words, as a Calvinist, I hold the following. While it is entirely customary and apposite for a Dominican to begin a remark, as a Thomist, I claim that. Now, this is not to suggest that Thomism is a monolith, far from it. As Fergus Carr has amply demonstrated, Thomism is a complex, not a simple, especially in the modern era. To begin a doctrinal document with the declaration as a Thomist I is simply to announce membership in a wide family. Perhaps this is more only more true with Lutherans. Some, but certainly not all Lutherans, consider themselves descended from the Protestant Luther and hold themselves accountable for the dogmatic positions Luther advanced, whether for good or ill. Indeed, I would argue that Calvin considered himself a Lutheran in just this way. He understood his vocation to consist in the consolidation and expansion of the dogmatic revolution Luther began. He laid claim to Luther Redivivus. Loyalty to the Lutheran or Thomistic programmatic 
for Calvin and for others is signaled by citation. This is Thomas on nature and grace, or here is Luther on law and gospel. And by a willingness, even eagerness, to explicate the inner coherence of these views. I think we could say that many of us in this room are Bardians in just this sense. But Bard himself was neither Bardian nor Calvinist in this way. Thomas and Lutherans move within a tradition and under a particular doctor of the church, whose doctrine is taken to be generative, authoritative, and foundational. Bart never recognized such a relation to Calvin or to Zwingli. It may be that in his student days, Bart felt such an allegiance to Schleiermacher or perhaps to Wilhelm Hermann. He was more inclined in his early liberal period to begin an essay with the proud words, we modern theologians hold such and such. But I think it is a striking and illuminating fact that Bard, once his break took hold, did not advert to a master, did not rely on a reformed authority, and did not seek to remain loyal to a magister's founding principles. When we examine the long pages of the church dogmatics, we do not find in them the idiom of the school governing Bart's theological construction. He discusses reformed theologians at length, yes, but so too does he devote long excursions to Thomas and to Anselm and to Augustine or John Damascene or Luther or Melanchthon. The church dogmatics reads as an ecumenical treatise an extended reflection on the common heritage of the Christian church. Of course, Bart was a great polemicist. His ecumenical Christian identity hardly stemmed from a melting irenicism. But it is characteristic of Bart's fierce debates with his contemporaries that his dogmatics rarely begins with a defense of Calvinist teaching, or a declaration that a vital reformed principle lies under attack. All this we might say was too religious for Barth's palate. Indeed, the very notion of religion, so vital to an understanding of Barth's early dogmatic work, reflects this deep reticence about churchly belonging. Barth was famously critical and self-critical of his own kin. From this stems the secular air that Hans Frey detected in Bard, a decidedly non-religious and even more non-churchly atmosphere that characterizes Bard's milieu. Late in the church dogmatics, Bard insisted that the proper theology, that proper theology is not a worldview, a Weltanschauung. It does not inhabit a spiritual sphere, but is rather worldly, a full citizen of the larger cultural and humane realm. All these elements lend Bard and his theology but an indirect purchase on reformed identity. But whence all this? Perhaps we spoke too hastily above in dismissing a biographical dimension to Bart's theological identity. After all, the lovely self-deprecating humor that makes Bart endearing to so many of us belongs hand in glove with his reserve about ecclesial identity. He was decidedly not a self-promoter. Such reserve extends to Bart's shorter and occasional works. Not surprisingly, his essays for ecumenical gatherings are less particular or denominational in scope and more attuned to large scale ecclesial documents, but they do not stand alone. 
Bard simply begins his brief compositions with an exegetical or dogmatic topic on preaching or on ethics or the state or sacraments and holds in great reserve an identifying marker such as Calvinist or Reformed. The reform does not announce itself in Barth's mature theology. Like Barth's own pronounced reluctance to examine his inner life for the wider public, Barth's reformed identity stood in the wings, so to say. It formed the deep background to his scholarly and religious life, not the entranceway. A comparison with Augustine might be instructive here. Hardly any Christian thinker before Luther spoke in such introspective and personal tones as did St. Augustine. Even the sometimes querulous tone of Gregory Nancy Ansis, so miserable for him in the backwaters, yet more miserable in the big city of Constantinople, this cannot match the probing search for the inward way in Augustine's thought. There is nothing like the confessions in Barth's expansive oeuvre. Even his autobiographical sketches that had the Bush and Teats biographies do not read as the pulsing inner skin of a life as does even a single page of the confessions. But this is not simply a matter of individual style or literary power of self-disclosure. It is rather a sign of a particular form of identity. Bard simply does not announce himself. He does not explore himself, but he also does not declare himself for his badge. Identity for Augustine is a theology and a church. Far more ready than Bart is Augustine to proclaim himself a defender of a school or a movement. He is the stout champion of the Catholic Church against Donatists, against Manichaeans, against heretics of many schools, against the pagans. Unlike Bart, Augustine is far more prone to declare the Catholic position on many subjects and in many venues. In the urgent, polemical, and seemingly never-ending crises of a long-enduring Donatist schism, Augustine urges his congregation to recognize, acknowledge, and confess the true church, its bishops and catechists, over against the vibrant, well-connected, and popular church of the confessors, a Donatism that surged into the majority time and again, and caught the attention of Roman proconsuls. Certainly, Bart knew how to defend and how to attack. His place in the confessing church is well known. But once again, we see Bart's characteristic hand in the Barman Declaration, a document that takes its stand on exegetical grounds, and its doctrine is an unfolding of the ethical demands of a God who lays claim to the whole of creaturely life. A school, a denomination, a particular and concrete church or synod or judicatory is not to be seen. It too is not an explicit reformed document, though claimed to be sure by the reformed worldwide. Unlike Bart, Augustine assimilated his urgent searching for the God of truth to his identity as Catholic prelate, advocate, and teacher. Inward and outward, Augustine was a member and herald of the great church, the Catholic Church of the Roman Imperium. Bart was not a Calvinist in this sense. He was also not a reformed theologian in the same sense as was Friedrich Schleiermacher. A comparison with the Glaubenslehrer may be instructive as well. Essential to the structure of the Christian faith is the highlighting 
in each dogmatic section of Protestant confessions or creeds that spring from Reformed and Lutheran churches of the 16th and 17th centuries. Because of the remarkable generativity and novelty of Schleiermacher's method, the student of his work may be forgiven for considering these citations a form of courtesy to ancient voices, a nod in the direction of honored forebearers. Always conscious of history and eager to find his place within a collective spiritual life, Schleiermacher did appeal to his ancestors in the faith for warrant for his own distinctive, sometimes radical expression of a faith received from the past. But these citations do much more work in the Christian faith than mere courtesy or warranting suggest. Schleiermacher took his identity from the ecclesial documents of the Lutheran and Reformed churches. He clearly read well beyond these confines. The appeal to Anselm's fides querens intellectum graces the opening of the Glaubenslehre, as well as Barth's celebrated investigation of the proslogion. But Schleiermacher read Augustine or Thomas or Irenaeus as a reformed theologian, a particular kind of pietist, descended from the Swiss reform and nurtured in Germany and Lutheran soil. He begins dogmatic work after the rupture with Rome. He cites the magisterial reformers and knows them well. But what grounds Schleiermacher's mature work are the official teachings, the confessions, and the catechisms of the Protestant world. The lengthy introduction to the Christian faith gives us Schleiermacher's method his analysis of the religious development of humankind and his delicate sense for the spiritual essence of monotheisms as known by the cultured of early modern Europe. But the dogmatic content itself derives from the church declarations of the 17th century, the established Lutheran and reformed polities. Schleiermacher's theology has a starting point, a clear and distinct one, we might say, and that is in the groundwork of Protestant synodal and conciliar decrees. Now, there is only one document in Barth's corpus, the only one I know, that mirrors such a structure. Barth's early lectures at Gürtigen on the Reformed Confessions. Translated under the title, The Theology of the Reformed Confessions, these lectures represent Barth's entry into professional theology as incumbent of the newly created professor in Reformed dogmatics at the University of Göttingen. Delivered during the summer semester in 1923, these lectures offer an unsurpassed initiation into Barth's theology in the dialectical period as it unfolded after the second edition of the Romans commentary. Poured into these lectures is the frantic work Barth took on as he moved from parish pastor into the university professoriate. Reading through the detailed and wide canvas of 16th and 17th century confessions, a lavish spread from Switzerland and the Low Countries through Italy, France, and Germany into the United Kingdom with a side glance at the United States, one can well believe Barth's report that he flew between desk and bed, sleeping fitfully only to rise early to work some more. It is a remarkable portrait of a tireless researcher and a born historian. The central axioms of these lectures will detain us in a moment, but here it is worth pausing to reflect on the complexity and ambiguity of this work 
in Bart's writings. Bart received the invitation to assume this chair while still holding the pastorate at Safanville. The consortium that funded the post feared that the reform theology of Germany was fast disappearing and losing its cogency in the midst of the Luther and Lutheran revival of the interwar years. For their part, the Lutherans on the Gürtigen faculty were uneasy about this brash dialectician and more uneasy still about a reformed theologian teaching dogmatics on a Lutheran faculty. The major publications that issued from Barth's years in Gürtigen reflected this simmering conflict. None were entitled dogmatics or theology, and each aimed to do so under indirect cover. More widely known, I believe, is Barth's first entry into systematic work, the Gürtigen dogmatics, as it is known in Anglophone circles but it is originally titled, Of Necessity, Instruction in the Christian Religion, an obvious homage to Calvin. Significantly, this two-volume work followed the architectonic of all Barth's later work, a thesis statement setting out the main lines of argument for the chapter, followed by a lengthy exposition and exegesis of key scriptural passages. No epigraphs from the Reformed Confessions inaugurate these chapters. But the 1923 lectures on the theology of the Reformed Confessions dares to do so. These are essays that purport to examine Reformed Confessions as starting point and groundwork, the very substance of theological reflection. They do so in an intensely polemical atmosphere. This is a species of electic theology, refining, clarifying, distinguishing one's own position against one against the other. And Francois Turretin is perhaps the best known exemplar of this late scholastic style. Bart has been forced by circumstances to step out into the public realm as reformed. He stands before us in these lectures as an explicit member of the reformed school in theology. And he cites the rich array of reformed documents as warrant and foundation for doctrinal positions. The lectures repeat this dialectical self-definition in concentric circles the nature of confession itself, Reformed and Lutheran, the scripture principle as he understood it in those years, Reformed over against Lutheran, followed by an extensive exposition of Reformed theology, divided into subdivisions along elenctic lines. Debate with the old church, Bart's title for the medieval church, the controversy with Lutheranism, the battle against modern Christianity, a fusillade of Bart's dogmatic firepower, and an illuminating section simply entitled The Positive Doctrine of Christianity. Here in an extended form, we see Schleiermacher's legacy at work. Bart presents himself as a reformed theologian a member of a school, deriving his dogmatic positions from the official ecclesial documents of early modern Europe. This is rare. Indeed, I believe a hapex legomenon in all Bart's sweeping terrain. It differs toto cielo from Bart's later and repeated expositions on the Heidelberg Catechism, one of Bart's darlings, which simply treated the document as a Christian testimony worthy of our careful attention and theological gratitude. This Gürtigen lecture series differs too from another celebrated lecture cycle, the Gifford lectures, 
delivered in the steamy years 1937 to 1938 under the title, The Knowledge of God and the Service of God. Underlying the whole is the Scots Confession of 1560, cited at the head of each lecture. Perhaps one might think this is the exception to my rule. Bart once again appears to place reform documents at the center of the theological task to take his orientation from them and to lay out for the audience a dogmatics loyal to the 16th century reformers of the Kirk. Once again, too, Bart confesses himself a reformed theologian. And time and again, he describes himself as a member of the reformed branch of the Church of Christ, a stubborn partisan of the school. Perhaps the Gifford Lectures is the black swan, and I must revise my austere account of Bart's reformed identity. But I have not yet been persuaded of this fate because I believe something distinct and distinctive is underway in these lectures on the Scots Confessions. I might best point to this distinctive by turning to James Barr's celebrated Gifford lectures delivered some half century later on the topic, biblical faith and natural theology. Barr has many targets in his sights, but Karl Barth is primus inter pares. It is a tribute to the unique character of Barth's Gifford lectures that Barr finds himself still outraged by the arguments Barth advanced and refused to advance about revelation, about scripture, and in an indirect fashion about natural theology. My own view is that Bart is not a successful interpreter of Bart, but that verdict does not touch the force of Barr's assessment of those early lectures, nor on the marvelous plain speaking of the whole series. Barr is a splendid lecturer, and his series is a bracing tour of his own preoccupations with the biblical theology movement. But Barr remains uneasy over Bart's stubborn example, irritating after all these years. Barr considers Bart to have a conceptual or philosophical position on natural theology and general revelation. And Barr charges, Bart forces his biblical text to fit into this ill-sized and ill-considered frame. Barr has not won the day on his analysis of Bart's exegesis, I would say, but he has put his finger on a defining character of Bart's Gifford lectures. Like the informal lectures given in Bonn some years later, Bart's Giffords are a precy of evangelical theology, or perhaps better, his own dogmatic program. Bart considered the theological task to be laid upon one. The theologian is accountable for the history of doctrine and must answer for his or her reception and assessment of the whole. As in Bonn, so in Aberdeen, Bart took upon himself the presentation of Christian dogmatics as he understood it, and as scripture had to that moment instructed him. These lectures are a verdict, that is, and Bart confesses publicly to a Christian faith that echoes the Scots Confession but does not stem from it. He agrees in the main with its findings, but that only because they run consistent with the larger witness of scripture. Once again, then, in this seeming counterexample, we find Bart offering only an indirect reformed identity, one in which the reformed position concurs with Bart's own testimony to Holy Scripture's record of Emmanuel, God with us. Barr is right then in this one narrow sense about Bart's Gifford lectures. Barr brings to his task 
a mature dogmatic theology. By 1937, his church dogmatics are now well underway. And he does not need the Scots Confession or any Reformation document to ground or warrant his theology. Indeed, just this is Barth's insistence upon revelation, a reformed position, as he sees it, and upon a correlate, an indirect opposition to natural theology of Brunner's sort, but of every sort, including Lord Gifford's. The Globenslera is still not in view. So we may well ask just how does Bart understand the Reformed tradition? In what sense may we vindicate the claim that Bart is a Reformed theologian and stands as a member of that proud tradition? Here, the theology of the Reformed confessions does the heavy lifting. On the basis of those lectures, I want to suggest that Bart identified the Reformed tradition in a particular fashion that he never abandoned. He held that Reformed theology is a mode of Christian dogmatics and not a series of doctrinal positions. We might, with some hesitation, characterize Bart's notion as a formal distinction over a material one. But as I hope to specify a bit further on, Bart's handling of the Reformed identity does not fit easily into that handy distinction. For Bart, too, finds the Reformed tradition rich in material dogmatic content. It may be better to say that a particular doctrine of God gives rise to a particular mode of doctrine. Content, in this sense, governs and gives rise to form, a position Bart enunciated early in his career and never yielded. The God who encountered the young Sophenville pastor was both hidden and sovereign. The fundamental claim of Bart's Gerdigan lectures Indeed, I would hazard of his entire majestic church dogmatics is that almighty God is Lord. This conviction never leaves him, even in the famed Lictilera of Church Dogmatics 4.3. That Barr considered that beloved excursus on the lights of the world to be a form of natural theology tells me that this fundamental orientation of Barth's re reform theology has not been registered by Barr, or I think by the many admirers of that splendid section of the doctrine of reconciliation. God is hidden, transcendent, lofty, the Lord. I do not know if this is an episode in Barth's spiritual biography but I believe that it is consonant with Barth's conviction throughout his career that the name of God is properly uttered by the word Lord. It seems to be a decision of unknown antiquity, but certainly codified by the Tanaim, that the Tetragrammaton would be vocalized by the Hebrew plural Adonai. For Bart, such a decision could not be an act of simple courtesy or court protocol. Rather, the rabbinic tradents are setting forth an identity, the true God of Israel, the high and lofty one cannot be addressed by his given name, but is rather identical to the spoken name Lord. Thus is uncovered an analytic judgment, as Kant would have it, the predicate Lord contained in that ambiguous and much studied relation, contained in the subject, the unsaid tetragrammaton. The shadow of the possessive, Adoni, is salient here too, I believe. 
to speak of this transcendent God is to speak of one's own Lord, Adoni, my Lord. Thus is laid out in Exodus 3, the entire architectonic of Barth's doctrine of God. Israel's God is both hidden, unsaid and unutterable, and Lord, the direct and irresistible sovereign of the people who know him. The dialectic of hiddenness and lordship is embedded in the metaphysics of God himself and gives rise to the conceptual dialectic of transcendence and revelation, of veiling and unveiling, the dominant themes of the first volumes of the church dogmatics. The mode that recognizes this austere and graceful truth is reformed theology. I think Barth's reformed identity is that simple and that demanding. Let me express this in less methodological and more explicitly dogmatic idiom. I believe that in these early lectures, Barth clarifies, confesses, and articulates the conviction that lordship is the essential predicate of Israel's God. By essential predicate, I mean that any deity that would be conceived or that would appear without lordship would not be God in this world or in any possible world. In the idiom of Church Dogmatics 2.1, we would say that the true and hidden God is the one who loves in freedom. Now, notice here that I'm speaking directly and simply of the doctrine of God, introducing a kind of speculative note, if you will, into this discussion and a sojourn into the land of divine attributes. This I believe to be the very heart of the matter. We might begin by speaking of sovereignty as the content of the doctrine of God. This is not foreign, I believe, to Barth's entire enterprise. Indeed, in the Gurdigan lectures, Barth considers Lutheran confessions, and most especially the Augustana, to teach this very material. In this way, Barth considers the Reformed and Lutheran confessions to be united. The material content of the doctrine of God is identical. And in just this way, we may think of Calvin as a Lutheran. He holds to the same material positions as does Luther, and he defends them as the proper exegesis of Holy Scripture. Because Barth can speak in just this speculative or metaphysical fashion, it is easy and I think in some ways justified to range Barth's position against other scholastics, medieval and early modern, and to press his doctrine of God to clarify just how the transcendent or theological perfections of God relate to the economic and revealed attributes of this lordly God. Indeed, in much of Church Dogmatics 2.1, Bart defends a form of counterfactual reasoning to handle the relation between the transcendent and imminent attributes of the one God. The Lord need not reveal himself, Bart will write time and again, or the Lord is free in his condescension to his creatures, or more directly, the one Lord is sufficient love in himself and has no need of the world as sight of his gracious loving kindness. Rather, the perfections of God overspill, flow down, cascade upon the dry earth. But the Lord God himself is eternally rich, eternally free, in a word, sovereign over his very perfections. Israel's God is Lord. Of course, such straightforward metaphysical analysis of Barth's doctrine of God leads to many conceptual puzzles. 
one that preoccupy much BART scholarship and has received close attention from many of the scholars in this room. Should grace be considered a perfection of God's transcendent nature? Or more strikingly, obedience? Does this not undermine divine aseity? Or in more stark terms, render the cosmos necessary to the sovereign God? How do these metaphysical worries relate to Christology? This last question seems to me vital in our larger reflections on Barth's relation to the reform tradition. Familiar to all of us is the notion of Christological concentration, the exclusive and unyielding insistence upon Jesus Christ as the proper and sole revelation of the true God. Such Christological focus has been widely seen as the hallmark of Barth's theology, derided by his critics as Christomonism, applauded by his followers as the mature expression of a reformed doctrine of revelation. I would not want to set aside Barth's intense preoccupation with Christology, better with the person of Jesus Christ, and it is the maxim of Barth's early volumes in the Church Dogmatics that Jesus Christ is Lord, a consummation of the doctrine of divine sovereignty. But I think it is worth our consideration here, as we reflect upon Barth's theological identity, that his early and most direct expression of his reformed allegiance is not Christological in character. The theology of the Reformed Confessions is devoted to the doctrine of God exclusively, as were many of Barth's lectures from the dialectical era. They are not contrary to Christology. Indeed, if I am right, the Christology of the mature period is rather the full expression of this agonized encounter with the God who is Lord. I take this to be the force of Professor McCormick's periodization of Barth's development in those years as a dialectical theology in the shadow of a consistent eschatology. Critical to our theme, however, is the recognition that for Barth, throughout his life, the essential lordship of God governs all including who Jesus Christ is and what he means, the Lord who became servant, the servant exalted as Lord. To claim lordship as absolute or essential is to bring the doctrine of God into the realm of relational attributes. It is to speak of God in relation to creature. God is Lord of the creation. Thomas Aquinas groups lordship with creator and redeemer as relational attributes. They are disclosed in relation to the cosmos. Thomas, to be sure, has a complex arsenal to free such a classification from the suspicion that God is now prisoner to his own creation. But Bart does not avail himself of these scholastic weapons. And it is vital to his reformed identity that he does not. For Bard here swings perilously close to the liberal relationalism typified in Schleiermacher that Bard opposed in bitter earnest throughout the 1920s and 30s. Lordship will be the elixir that cures him, as he sees it, from the disease of liberal coherence. In this way, Bart aims to relate metaphysics and epistemology in a different manner, one elemental to his reformed identity. To be reformed is to affirm that an essential predicate of God is in itself a mode. Lordship is a mode of divine being. Thus is the doctrine of God both a species of transcendence and imminence, of being and knowing, 
of freedom and love. And thus much reformed theology, while ever so faithful to the doctrine of the Reformation, cannot in truth be considered reformed. The modal construal of divine predicates transforms Barth's notion of epistemology. He does not think of the doctrine of knowledge as an ineluctable offshoot of our own self-involvement in any act of encountering reality. He is not simply making the observation keenly set forth by Kierkegaard in his ridicule of Hegelianism that the human subject cannot be erased from the description of the real. Of course, the knower is implicated in the known. Bart is often thought to teach that faith is conformed to its object in this sense. No one knows God in a neutral fashion as if almighty God were a piece of furniture in the cosmos. Certainly this is true and Bart affirms this, but Bart's fundamental conviction runs deeper, I believe. The proper knowledge of God, the one who is Lord, is acknowledgement, is the acknowledgement of being mastered. That is why Christian life and Christian faith are forms, modes of obedience. The Christian has a Lord. Just this relatio is revelation. Once again, the radicality of Barth's position is sometimes lost in the welter of conceptual reflection on the category revelation. It is certainly true that Barth writes in many places, not least in the celebrated Lictilera, that God could have spoken wherever he wished, in the cosmos, in the famous dead dog, but he elected to speak in Holy Scripture and we should listen to him there. All true. But Bart's claim here cuts far deeper, more incisively than this summary suggests. Israel's God does not simply disclose that God is Lord. He does this, but revelation is the event of God's lordship. He parts the heavens and comes down as Lord of the creature. We are seized by that power and we are claimed for him. When this event has taken place, the creature is now freed for obedience, as Bart characteristically puts the advent of faith. Our intellect now is put in service of this lordship, tracing its outlines, exploring its election and act, following the contours of its incursion into the land of unlikeness, the world of disobedience and folly. We do not master this object. We do not enter into his infinite reserve, nor trace out the qualia of such a being as though the initiators of this search. God's hiddenness is the implicator of God's lordship. Epistemology is ingredient in metaphysics because the ontology of the servant is analytically contained in the majesty of the free Lord. There is no neutral knowledge of God just because speculative attributes that do not rest on lordship cannot by definition belong to the true God. Christology tells this event, the disclosure of the lordship of God and the true obedience of his creature all in one history, one life. Now, all this is a mode of writing theology. It stems from a conviction that Israel's God is essentially Lord. The traditional attributes of God, sketched out in many reformed confessions and headlined in the Scots Confession, do not express a moment of natural theology or rational faith in the cardinal documents of the Reformation. Rather, contra mundo, Bart arraigns them as expressions and exemplars 
of the one Lord's hidden majesty. He cannot be contained or comprehended by our intellect, but is rather sovereign. To confess this, to halt before the irreducible glory who is God, to place our hands over our mouths, to acknowledge our uncleanness before him, to wait upon him like a servant. This is to speak and act as a reformed theologian. Or throughout his dogmatic career will disagree with many, many reformed theologians, perhaps with them all. He was, as Christiane Tietz observes in her splendid biography, a theologian in conflict. Even James Barr cannot resist noting how many reformed theologians oppose Barth's prohibition on natural theology and gladly pursue this ancient art with little regard for Barth's strictures. I think once again, Barr has right on his side, yet not Barth on his side. For reformed theology is not material content, not doctrine alone. It is rather that content, that doctrine under a mode, the mode of obedience to a living Lord. Whoever speaks this way confesses that he or she has a Lord, and in just this way confesses with the reformed doctors of the church that Israel's God is Lord of all the earth. Just so, as Bart emphasizes in his early lectures time and again, that a reformed theolo theologian must have both doctrine and ethics as main ingredients. The third use of the law, so common in Calvinist circles, simply expresses for Bart the knowledge of God, which is obedience to one's Lord. This is a narrow way, a straight gate, and I think one against which many questions can be raised, but it is a splendid confinement, one that imprisons all, that the Lord may have mercy upon all. This is the way, Bart would say, walk in it. Thank you. Always just a gift to be able to listen to one of your papers, Mr. Shanker. Thank you so much. And we have some time now for some conversation, some questions and answers. If anyone would like to go first to gather your thoughts and then feel free to speak up. I know there are questions out there. Okay. Uh, please. It's great to see you, Dan. It's great to see you, Kate. Um, Kate, your, your lecture, as always, is uh, one of stimulation and beautifully crafted. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you. I do have a question. Good, good. Um, are you identifying the Reformed tradition as the confessional term? And when you find that Bart is not a reformed theologian, are you asking whether he fits that category? And then you find that he doesn't fit that category. So he's only an indirect reformed tradition. But suppose we understand the reformed tradition as a continuously reforming tradition. Uh, yeah. So that um, when, for example, we talk about lordship, question is, what does that mean? Who is Lord? What does it mean to be Lord? When you, when you make the statement, Jesus Christ is
sin, the true lordship itself is being abstract, perhaps filled with such uh, terms as um, sovereignty, <coughs> glory, holiness, and so forth. But if we are to be satisfied only with that, would we then be talking about the reform tradition in this second sense, not of confessional tradition, but in terms of a continuously revising movement. Bart says we begin again and again at the beginning. And that, I think, indicates his uh, interest in thinking of reform as a continuing process of the, hearing the word of God find its center in Christ. But that never, that movement never stops. And in, in that regard, I'm stopping too much here, but in that regard, it's a, a, someone from another theological tradition, like Karl Wanner in the Catholic tradition, who also want to understand himself, not as frozen in a confessional tradition. The Calcedon uh, definition, for example, is a beginning for thought, not something that limits us or constrains us, froze, freezes us into a particular cultural uh, time of understanding exactly what those words mean. Mm -hmm. So the question basically is, isn't there a, a, an issue here of just what, what you're dealing with when you talk about is part of reform theology? Yeah. Yeah, this lovely, thank you, Dan. And it's, um, I, I tried to, um, pick some uh, contrasting examples uh, in Schleiermacher and Calvin that I thought, um, uh, and Augustine that I thought might be illuminating, but Rahner, of course, would be an illuminating uh, comparison as well. Uh, my, my own conviction as I think about um, what, what Bart did in the Gerdigan lectures, and what I see in, um, at least in the, the um, volumes of the church dogmatics, is someone who is thinking about um, the reformed as uh, enunciating an, uh, an existential encounter with um, God's lordship in such a way that everything that is said it, uh, theologically, uh, doctrinally, dogmatically is said as one who has been overmastered, uh, one who has encountered the Lord. So the Lord is not um, a, uh, a descriptor uh, or a um, a, a plain doctrinal attribute, but is an expression of what has happened to the person who encounters this hidden and majestic Lord. Um, now, I think because of that, theology is constantly renewing and beginning again, because always the servant listens to the master. Uh, always you're being instructed again. So I think that principle of uh, semper reformanda is, is a working out of this existential relatio that is um, uh, the event of God's mastering the, um, the theologian. Um, now that I, I think is the reason that Bart thinks um, all forms of natural theology are forms of idolatry um, because the, it is possible to have the agency of the theologian um, investigate and seek after the absolute savior, say as Rahner would put it. Um, and that I think for Bart is a, a violation of this fundamental relation. It's, it's not a proposition, but it's this mode. So I, 
I, I think that that's consistent with some of the other ways in which you were characterizing the reform tradition, but I, I think its, it's engine is driven by this modal um, relation. That's the first pass. Can we, can, sorry, can we use the microphone for the online people? Thank you very much. Um, I'm just a, a bit puzzled that if you have lordship, doesn't lordship, which would assume, I guess, it's some sort of subjectivity or at least um, activity, yeah. um, and in order to have activity, you need something towards which there is uh, that activity is directed, which is to say that you then come back to the sort of problem that you had uh, that Methodius pointed out with origin. Um, uh, you know, can be God be eternally creator, and um, of course, then one enters into the very problematics that you were alluding to, uh, that were discussed uh, a decade or so ago. Um, so, um, otherwise, uh, essentially, lordship becomes just sort of pure raw freedom, which is is precisely what uh, Bart is opposed to. If God is the one who loves in freedom. And lordship, above all, is lordship in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how does one avoid these problematics? Yeah, this, um, I think this is um, exactly the the right question to ask. It's it's why I'm. I have to say that I'm I'm not. If I read Bart right here, I'm I'm not persuaded uh, that this is the way in which um, dogmatic and reformed theology should be prosecuted um, because of these conceptual and traditional dogmatic uh, problems. But I think, I think Bart would say um, this, this is just, um, this is Kate saying um, she either does not have a Lord or does not want to have one. Um, that um, that to uh, to think um, about the this counterfactual um, a problem of uh, God's existence um, uh, um, contra mundum, I mean, um, uh, apart from the world, um, is to imagine that that I can think about Lord as if I am Lord. Uh, and he says that again and again in the theology of the um, Reformed Confessions, that, that what um, speculative questions represent is the human being as Lord uh, and God as uh, his object. And so... I think that that means that this very question, which I, I agree is, um, is one of the central puzzles about how to defend the aseity of God. Um, and, and this is where I, I, I find uh, Thomas's treatment so powerful. But, but I, think, I think Bart would say um, we we have to see who we are as theologians. We are already inside this electing lordship of God. And, and when we are there and when we acknowledge that, um, we say this is who God is. And, and we, we simply find ourselves already uh, within this relation of lordship. So this question about, um, uh, about how it is that um, God is um, to be thought of apart from creation is uh, one of these um, speculative temptations uh, to think outside our being servant. Now, I think... Um, uh, the way in which Bart wants to at least 
respond to the originist tradition is to say um, Lord means one who is uh, hidden, one who uh, exists in reserve and in majesty. So uh, to acknowledge that, that God is Lord is, is not to say um, God is simply the one in relation to me, um, but God is always um, in excess, um, um, hidden in, in majesty, uh, in a dark cloud and, and fire. And, um, and that is not a God who can be um, imprisoned in his own cosmos. I, I think that, I think Bart wants to um, uh, carry out the, the exercise of, of what I would think of as um, metaphysical and, and properly speculative questions about the doctrine of creation under that mode. Dr. Sunday, thank you for that powerful presentation. I'd like to turn to the other side of the dialectic and the way that you use the term obedience. And I think it complements some of the questions. Um, Raymond Anderson, in his little book, talks about, he was a graduate student of Bart, this piece called The Table Talks. He talks about that Karl Barth had to do a little, a little word study for American theologians because of the way that he uses the word obedience, the host, right? right? And, and his point is, it, doesn't, it has a different inflection than the way we hear it, which allows for a type of improvisation. So I'm wondering if you thought much about that in terms of how that might relate to the way we talk about lordship, the relationship between lordship and obedience heard in this much more inflected way that Bart may have meant. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And um, in, in one way, um, obedience has, has roots uh, even in, in English in, uh, in hearkening to, in, in hearing, um, in recognizing or acknowledging. Um, and I, I think that that might, might tie with what uh, Professor Migliori was raising about the, uh, the constant um, movement and reconsideration of theology. And as you were suggesting so well, the way in which it, it has a kind of uh, liveliness uh, and improvisational character. And that is characteristic, I think Bart would say, of, of what it is to be a, a servant is that always the Lord speaks uh, a new command. Uh, always there's new instruction. Um, always there's thinking deeper and, um, and um, recognizing the same object in a fresh way. So when he uses that image of walking around the, the mountain, but at a higher um, pass each time, that seems to me consistent with the idea that that uh, what I'm to do as as the uh, as the servant, as one who who acknowledges uh, God's lordship, is that I am to hear His voice each day, and so um, fresh each morning um, is His word to me. So um, so it may well be that I have to reconsider everything that I said before, and that's going to be. Um, in itself, lively. It's it, it's not going to be. Um, it, it's not going to be um, a propositional or doctrinal in this sense that I simply have a a loyalty to certain positions. This is one of the reasons I think Bart is not reformed in a a scholastic sense. Uh, he's he's not saying well the reformed. Um, theologian holds to uh, such and such in the doctrine of election. Um, the reform theologian holds this and that about the Lord's Supper. Um, it's instead that the reform position is as one who hears um, each day a, a fresh word. Yeah. We have a question online, which oh, is going to flex okay. our technological capacity. Okay. I'll stand back at this point and wait for the magic to happen. I'll leave it out. To what extent did Bart's emphasis on God's lordship 
influences reticence to identify strictly with a certain denomination or tradition. Okay, this influences flexible approach to engaging a variety of Christian followers. Yeah. yeah, wonderful question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think this is a, um, a wonderful uh, summary. Maybe we all could have gotten out um, for um, a walk in the beautiful evening air if I had just read this question and then we'd be done. I, um, I, my thought here is that, that uh, reform theology is not a particular body of teachings for Bart. I, uh, I think, I mean, he holds many of them. Um, but I, I think what is really central for him is this way of writing theology. I, I, th I think it's, it's parallel to the, the early uh, Luther in, in the uh, Heidelberg uh, Disputation. It, there you, you see Luther thinking about theology as a mode, it's, the, it's what a, a person does who has encountered the cross, um, who sees in God's hiddenness um, his true revelation and who thinks sub contrario. The, um, I, th I think um, Bart is thinking uh, what it is to be reformed is to be a laid hold of. That's why uh, Bart constantly emphasizes that that uh, Kantian question: uh, What is it that we are to do? Uh, the the significance of the law um, and the the um, uh, third use emerges out of this conviction that that our life has been claimed, and um, God is instructing and commanding and summoning us. Um, and that's a that's a style. It's a mode in which theology is done, um, and allows him to be quite free in the way he responds to his own uh, reformed upbringing. Uh, he enters into ecumenical uh, discussions in a, a very um, open way, and I I think he does that. Because as long as he is, he is the servant of God, he, he, he just is enacting the reformed position. Now, um, red and blue check in the back. I might just wait till oh. the microphone reaches you. Thank you. Yeah. Is yeah. It, I, I don't see in the it, light. Is it Eric? It's Eric. Yeah, Eric. great. Yes. Thanks yeah. so much. I've, I'm sorry the, the light dazzles. Yeah. <laughs> I really appreciated the kind of, uh, kind of roster of intellectual styles that you just were talking about that helped yeah. me think about what question you're asking. So my question would be, and maybe this is a bad question, but would it be too much of a question to say, um, is a reformed theologian someone who doesn't ask the question, would Yahweh be Yahweh without us? Oh, very nice, very nice, right. Or, or uh, is it just the mm -hmm. mode in which we ask the question, which kind of almost relates to the mode, right. modality language of divine being you're talking about? Right, what right, I mean, you just, uh, um, the, uh, the way you put that is, is beautiful. I, I think I, when I read through the Gertigan lectures, I just I heard Bart saying um, over and over that that wonderful way in which he reads um, the the Genesis narrative. Did God say no? I I, I think he I think he holds that it is fundamental to um, the Exodus three account that the um, divine name be unutterable and that what is uttered is vocalized as Lord. Uh, and that, that I think he takes to be um, a statement of identity. So to, to ask the question, you, you can raise a question um, 
what would it be like for God not to be Lord or, or if uh, Lordship were not an essential predicate? Um, but you, you have to be very careful about how you ask that question, I think Bart would say. Um, it, that's where it comes close to, did God say, right? Did God say, I am Lord? Uh, um, because it, if you think, um, well, I, I want to... I want to consider the the aseity of God quite apart from creation, and I, I think I think this is what what uh, Bart would um, would say about a question like that. I th I think he'd say, if you are are considering this, because you think it actually would be somehow um, much more edifying and much. Uh, grander and more sophisticated to start thinking about the aseity of God apart from creation. Um, you already have shown uh, your rebellion against God's lordship. So you, you could raise it instead as um, a lordship imp implies this, this veiling, this hiddenness. So of course it must be that God is free uh, over his creation, free not to create, so that there's some way in which God's lordship is going to be realized in an unimaginable way uh, in his aseity. Uh, but, but that's all the further, um, as a reformed theologian, I should speak. I think Bart would say this, um, because to actually entertain it, uh, and not just as a bare counterfactual, is to declare myself um, free of having a Lord. Yeah, it's a great question, Eric. We Thank you. Over time, um, oh, and we're going to take sorry. one last question from online, if that's okay, before we wrap up. Okay, great. In his conference uh, on the note of the Evangelischen Kirche of 1931, Bart considers that the essential characteristic of evangelical church is to be the church under the cross, what do you think is the role of the cross of Christ in relation to the dimension of the Lordship yeah. in Bart's thought? Is it possible to say that the true Lordship of Christ, according to Bart, is represented by the cross? Mm. Yeah, what a wonderful question. Yeah, so there he's, he's really showing, I think, the influence of um, the Heidelberg Disputation and his intensive study of Luther in his early years. I, I think, remember how, how Bart takes um, the passion and the resurrection as um, two moments of a single event. They, they have an ordering, there's a taxis to them. Um, but we don't we don't think of the um, the um, lowliness of the uh, eternal Son without the exaltation of the royal man. So I I think that that Bart would say um, the theology of the cross is is clearly uh, central to the gospel central to the, the um, lordship of Christ. And this is why the, the son um, goes into the far country um, and um, is, is glorified in this. Um, but it, it is not um, the, the cross only, it, it is the um, this way is also the exaltation of the royal man. So I think that uh, that Bart would um, see the theology of the cross in this fuller way, the way in which um, the the dominical word um, from the cross, uh, consummatus est, it is finished, is a, a victory cry. I think uh, so long as we have um, lordship holding 
um, both um, that that lowliness and that exaltation, I think he would say, yes, of course, this this is the Lordship of Christ. Um, Thank you. I, I wish you all. for me to do three things with great concision. The first is to ask if we have any announcements that need to be made just now. Uh, we will return here at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Um, so if you come back, please come back at 9. Um, unless you have not registered yet, you can stop by the booth before the 9 o'clock. Thank you so much. The second thing is to thank you all once again for being here and those of you following online. It's been a great start to our conference proceedings together. And the third and final thing is just to ask you to join me once again um, for her stimulating paper on the wonderful conversation. Um, thank you. Thank you. Good evening to you all. Thank <laughs> you.